Good day, everyone. Welcome. This is Ray Ford with FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Small Business and Industry Assistance Program, also known as CEDAR SBIA. Our webinar today is the most common issues with C disk SEND data and FDA toxicology review. CEDAR's Office of Computational Science, also known as OCS, will discuss trends with the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, Standards for Exchange Non Clinical data, also known as cdesk SIN, data quality issues and sponsor submitted studies as well as how industry may resolve them. OCS manages the Kickstart service which provides data quality assessments to pharmacology and toxicology reviewers in the Office of New Drugs. The webinar to entirety will be posted both video and audio on our website within five days and that website is fda.gov forward slash CDR SBIA webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to cover some details. Slides for today's presentation are available from the right-hand side of your screen where the orange button says, Download the Presentation. This activity is eligible for continuing education by SOCRA, RAPS, SQA, and ACRP. Please refer to our website at fda.gov forward slash CDRSBIA for more details. You'll be able to obtain the attendance certificate upon completion of the survey, which will remain open for two weeks. That means it will close on September 26. Even if you don't need a certificate, we'd appreciate it if you let us know your comments and feedback via the survey. To outline today's event, the webinar in its entirety will run approximately one hour, which includes a Q&A session. Our speakers for today's presentation include Jesse Anderson, Program Manager, Kickstart Service, Office of Computational Science, Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR FDA, and Jennifer Feldman, SIN Subject Matter Expert. Welcome to our first speaker, Jesse. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm here with my colleague, Jen Feldman. We are here to discuss a few topics today. We will provide information on how SEND data is used at the FDA. We will look at data fitness issues we have seen at the agency and how we are communicating these SEND issues to both sponsors and the SEND community. I'm sure many on this call are familiar with SEND data. As an overview, single dose toxicity, repeat dose toxicity, carcinogenicity, and cardiovascular and respiratory safety pharmacology studies are currently covered by both SEND IG 3.0 and 3.1 and the FDA standards catalog. SEND should present non-clinical data in a consistent and predictable manner and allow its users, including FDA reviewers, to explore study data and automate the creation of tables and graphs. Incorporating SEND study data into a review is a process change for the FDA reviewer community, and many submissions require quick turnarounds due to short review timelines. Because of this process change, OCS continues to deliver the Kickstart service and other resources to support reviewer use of electronic SEND data sets. This is an overview of the non-clinical data submissions and the regulatory review process. The data produced by industry, which is represented by the building blocks in this diagram, goes through multiple processes once submitted to the FDA. After submission through the ECTD, studies go through a series of validation rules. After the data is validated, the FDA loads the data into Janus on Clinical and other analytical tools to help Farm Talks reviewers in the Office of New Drugs, or OND, complete their review more efficiently. The Kickstart service is also offered to these Farm Talks reviewers, and more information on the Kickstart service will be provided in a few minutes. This slide highlights the steady increase of SEND submissions the agency received over the last three calendar years. This number is broken up by the number of INDs and the combined number of NDAs and BLAs submitted over each calendar year. Note that the figure for 2019 shows the number of studies as of May 2019. As you can see, the agency already exceeded the number of INDs for 2018 as of May of this year. Thus, the agency believes that the number of applications containing SEND data will grow exponentially over the coming calendar years. 
This will result in the need to process and review more send data. A key part to using the send data is Janus Non-Clinical, which is FDA's proprietary system for reviewing and visualizing send data sets. Every send study the FDA receives in an application automatically goes through the Janus Non-Clinical loading process. As of May 2019, more than 735 studies loaded to Janus Non-Clinical. After the data loads to the system, reviewers may request a Kickstart service to help orient them to their sent data in Janus Non-Clinical. The service consists of one-on-one -on -one training, data fitness assessments, and help with study data exploration and analysis. If reviewers do not wish to participate in Kickstart or need support after their service, they may always reach out to the OCS service desk for additional support. This graphic provides a snapshot and timeline of when studies successfully loaded into Janus Non-Clinical. Again, you can see OCS successfully loaded six studies associated with four applications in December 2017. This number increased to 110 studies associated with 50 applications just one year later. We reached our peak for the captured period in March 2019 with 122 studies associated with 58 applications successfully loading into Janus Non-Clinical. These numbers are sure to grow as more studies arrive to the agency. As I mentioned, the Kickstart service is offered by OCS to all Farm Talks reviewers in OND. A pre-Kickstart training provides an overview of the SEND standard, the Non-Clinical Study Data Reviewers Guide, or the NSDRG, the define.xml file, and the Janus Non-Clinical features. The Kickstart service itself has a data fitness assessment that contains a sponsor report and provides the reviewer details of issues that may impact their use of the data. It also shows reviewers how to explore study data using Janus Non-Clinical and how to produce tables and graphs that can be used in their review documents. Finally, the Kickstart team prepares graphs and key tables for key analyses in the reviewer's studies using Janus Non-Clinical. The next few slides discuss some demographic information on the applications and studies we have seen come through the Kickstart service. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the number of Kickstart services offered to FarmTalks reviewers. This table is broken down by the number of INDs and the combined number of NDAs and BLAs. On the right-hand side, you can see a breakdown of the review divisions the Kickstart service has supported thus far. OCS anticipates offering this to more reviewers and more divisions in the coming years as new reviewers join the FDA Farm Talks community and many more studies come into the agency. In this slide, you will see the various breakdowns of the studies included in Kickstart applications reviewed by the, by the team thus far. The majority of studies included in Kickstart services are repeat dose tox studies with a few single dose tox and CAR C studies included as well. The Kickstart team evaluated studies on a variety of species, but the majority of these studies have been on rats, monkeys, and dogs. Greater than half of the studies reviewed were done by test facilities in the US and Canada with a few additional test facilities elsewhere. And finally, the test facility organizations listed in the SEND data sets are most often CROs. Now we, now we will go through the steps of the Kickstart service. The pre-Kickstart training, which may also be offered separately by the OCS service desk, provides reviewers general training on relevant SEND-related topics that will be important as they move through their review of the SEND data. The topics are related to SEND domains, controlled terminology, an overview of the purpose of the NSDRG, an introduction to the defined file, and an introduction to Janus non-clinical functionality. The first portion of the Kickstart service itself looks at data fitness. This is both an automated and manual review of the SEND data sets, the NSDRG, and defined file for studies receiving the service. The checks include reviewing the compliance with standards and FDA rules and recommendations for the study data. 
We also provide a map between the study report test and observations to the submitted SIN data sets to confirm and document data that was not submitted. This helps ease the reviewer's transition from the PDF study report to using the SIN data sets in Janus Non-Clinical. Additionally, we check the consistency across study files and documents and call out any mismatches and ensure summarizations included in the study report can be reproduced. When discussing issues with the reviewer, the Kickstart team focuses on key data quality and usability issues that may, def may affect data analyses performed as part of their review. These might include discussions surrounding send data that should not be used by the reviewer or send data that can only be used with caveats. In addition to the data fitness information discussed with the reviewer, the team provides a comprehensive data fitness report that is in technical, sponsor-ready language and is provided to the review team for communication back to the sponsor. These comprehensive reports contain all of the issues identified by the Kickstart team. All issues provided in these reports are compiled and tracked across studies to identify trends that can be communicated to the public via various mediums, including this webinar. The second part of the Kickstart service is the data exploration session. This interactive tutorial helps reviewers understand the best way to interact with their study data using Janus Non-Clinical. The Kickstart team shows tables and graphs in key domains with findings that align with the submitted study report when possible. The team provides outputs to reviewers and shows them how to create these and other outputs that may be placed directly into their review documents. Now I will turn the discussion over to Jen, who will provide more information on the data fitness assessment and common data fitness issues seen by the Kickstart team. Thank you, Jesse. So I'll be covering common send issues in five different categories. We'll be looking at issues in the findings data sets. We will be looking at issues in study design and animal assignments. We'll look at subject elements, which are used to assign um, study phases when analyzing data. We'll look at a few NSDRG issues that affect the usability of the data sets and also cover a key area in Define XML. The group of studies that um, these findings are included up on are the same that Jesse discussed previously. So this is covers 79 different studies in 54 applications through May of this year. So first we'll look at the three most common issues in findings data sets and I'll illustrate how those impact the farm talks reviewers. Those three issues are the incorrect reporting of timing variables needed for summarization, incorrect reporting of categorical data, and omission of a numeric value to use in calculations as a replacement for a text result. First, the most common issues in findings data set timing variables. These issues were found in nearly all studies that we reviewed through the Kickstart service. So it's by far the most common problem in the data sets. In 10% of the studies, the problems with the timing variables were so serious that we had to advise the reviewer not to use some of the study data for analysis. This included completely missing timing variables or values in the timing variables that did not at all align with the study report. Then in 40% of those studies, we were able to instruct the reviewer on how they could use a workaround in Janus Non-Clinical to correctly align the data with the study report, even though the variables in the study report were not correctly included. This is most commonly seen when the collected study day is included in the send data sets in the visit DY variable instead of the report day. So in this first example that I'm going to show you, um, this is an area where the study days did not align with the report. And this is very small, so you'll have to get close to your laptop. So you can see the screen, um, but um, this is Janus Non-Clinical. We're showing just some of the um, columns so that we can focus on the timing. 
So what we have here are some mean results for males and females of each group. The groups and sexes are running down, and the timing is running across the top. The timing variables visit dy, and in some cases tpt, are shown in the headers, and then the mean values for those days are below. So what you can see from scanning across the column headers is that we've got males and females taken on a staggered schedule, but we've also got some mean values that are not aligned with any of the other values. When we compare this then with the study report, we find that some of the days were combined on the study report tables under a single label. So for example, we have the recovery days. There's three of them all combined under a single recovery table. We also have the same for the terminal. In particular, the female animals were split into two days. We also found in this comparison that there were two unscheduled sessions, the day one sessions, that were actually unscheduled events. But those had visit dy filled and in one case the tpt variable filled. Both of those variables are only for scheduled events and because they were incorrectly represented they end up being summarized together with all the scheduled data. So in this case, the reviewer can be instructed on how to use Janus non-clinical tools to combine certain days so that they will line up with the study report. However, that is considerable additional work on the part of the reviewer that would not have to be done if visit DY and TPT were correctly reported. This slide shows a similar issue. In this case, what I'm showing is actually the individual data that goes along with one measurement. In the similar organization, we're listing the uh, groups down each animal. The animal number has been eliminated from the screen for confidentiality. But we still have the timing variables running across the column headers with the visit dy variable shown as the day. You can see that with the individual data, you've got a few animals were off schedule from all the others. But that wasn't the most serious problem. In the callouts over to the left, now I'm showing how the data was labeled in the study report. The study report showed day minus 11 data, and that data aligned with what was in send day 12. The labeled data in the report for day minus 9 was actually a combination of day minus 11 and day minus 9 in send. And then day 25 in the study report combined 25 and 26. So while we were able to provide the reviewer with instructions on how to align this data with the study report, it was quite tricky, particularly with that day minus 11 labeling. Particularly difficult was the fact that this was just one measurement in the VS domain and other measurements were taken on different schedules, reported with different days, and had to be separately aligned for each measurement. In this slide, we're going to illustrate an issue that um, we've seen several times in kind of different variations with the variable ELTM. So ELTM, the elapsed time generally pre or post dose, is particularly useful for tabulating and graphing results relative to dose. But it's frequently missing or it's inconsistent with the labeling in the TPT variable. So this portion of the send data set PC shows just a few of the timing variables included in a data set. These were several data collection events that were done relative to two dose 
one on day one, one on day 28. On the 28 dose, there was a pre-dose sample that you can see labeled in TPT 0H0M. So we know from comparing that to the study report that that was the pre-dose event. However, you also see that on for day one dosing and day 28 dosing, there are two events labeled 24 hours or 24H. But if you look over to the ELTM, the elapsed time, that is labeled as zero, zero days in ISO 8601 format. And obviously, 24 hours post-dose is not the same as zero days post-dose. So what does Janice try to do with that? Over to the left now, you see a snippet of the summary screen from Janus Non-Clinical as it tries to interpret this data. The ELTM, the elapsed time post-dose, is shown first in a easier to read format of zero hours. And then you can see the two different time points are listed separately, but both under zero hours. So we have these, both the pre-dose and the 24-hour mislabeled sessions of data. As you can imagine, some reviewer looking at Janus at this data would be reasonably confused. And so it's important that these ELTMs properly align, the TPTs align with the ELTMs so that Janus can correctly summarize. And this last issue related to timing is one that we very commonly see. Again, it relates to placement of the collection day in the visit dy variable instead of the dose day. So the blue bar across the top um, is the header from Janice, as we've seen in those other screens. And this is showing us our ELTM, our elapsed time post-dose, and our visit dy as the day. So we have several um, bleeding sessions that were done relative to day one. You can see to the right, it's labeled 24 hours day two. But that is a 24-hour post-dose day one bleed. On the left, you can also see that the pre-dose, which we confirmed that's what that data uh, was intended to say, that was actually labeled as uh, 0.1 hours post-dose. So that's not quite as problematic as the mislabeling of the day on the right, um, but it is indeed an incorrect representation of pre-dose. The effect of this mislabeling, you can see down below in the chart. So this is a chart of the uh, dose concentrations over time with the time on the x-axis, and you can see that it ends at 12. And it ends at 12 because that 24-hour time point was not aligned with dose day one. So it is not charted with other dose day one values. Mm. Moving on from the timing variables, the next area of, that we very commonly see issues in is the reporting of categorical data. We see this problem occur in approximately 60% of the studies that we reviewed for Kickstart, most commonly in the LB data set for urinalysis and some hematology tests that are scored on a discrete scale. When this problem occurs, the appropriate analyses can't be automatically applied in Janus non-clinical. And I'll show you some examples of those. This first example shows us the group summary data for a couple of days. Those are shown down to the left with the groups going across. And you can see for each mean and standard deviation, there's a value. And then there's a little notation under it that says text. That's a signal to the reviewer that there's a mix of numeric and non-numeric data as results 
for the test and the dose level. The reviewers have the opportunity to bring up a detailed screen that will show them the individual values that made up that group summary mean and standard deviation. So when we do that for this data, what we see is that the stress C variable, so that's the result in character form, is to the far left. Slight homolysis, no homolysis. The result column is the stres n variable, the numeric form. And we see there that some of the results were given a value of zero. There was no information provided in the NSDRG what that zero was intended to relay. And you can see that it's not on all the results, and it's not on all the results of either of the particular value. This same problem occurred on many of the tests in this study, and so it left quite a bit of confusion about what that was intended, and the reviewer used the study report for their review rather than this data. The next example is similar. Here again is a summary for and this time it is urine protein. This was results from a test, a dipstick test. Again, we see that notation where we've got uh, mean standard deviations and the little text notation below. When we drill down to look at the details, you can see that some of the results are zero, and then some are within a range, as you'd expect on a dipstick test. The issue here is that uh, the stres n variable was filled any time a result, I want to say, looked like a number. But indeed, these are scores on a scale, not numeric data. And the result of this is the summary that you see above with uh, some numeric summarization and a notation that there's other data there that cannot be summarized. And last is kind of the opposite issue. So here again, we see a summary of uh, your analysis. It's urine pH this time. But we don't see any values. We just see text. We drill down, and we see that we just have the character form indicating to us this, that this is categorical data. However, the study report told us otherwise. And the study report included group means and standard deviations so in this case, to align with the study report, the stres n variable should have been filled. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to the third issue in the findings data sets, and that is uh, issues with character replacement values, the calc n not being submitted uh, when it's needed for summary calculations. This issue occurs on approximately 60% of the studies reviewed in Kickstart, and most commonly missing for plasma concentrations, but also missing in the LB data set. Right. So I'll take you through an example here of how this issue affects the reviewers. In the background, you again see a group summary table and the pop-up highlighted showing each of the individual animal values. So you see there we have some results that are less than 1.0. And those are character value results. But when we look at the study report, what we see in the highlighted text is a footnote telling us that for summary calculations, those entries that were less than 1.0, the value of 0.5 was used for summarization. However, in this study, the sponsor did not provide the calc n variable filled with 0.5 for those results. Therefore, the reviewer could not reproduce the summary results using Janus. A reminder here is that um, how the FDA expects 
this data to be submitted. Here, also the visit DY, ELTM, and TPT variables. And in addition, the qual how the categorical data should be submitted. All of that information has been included in the FDA Technical Conformance Guide. So that's a great resource for reviewing expectations. Now I'm going to move to away from the findings data sets to talk a little about some issues that we've encountered with what we'd call foundational data sets. Essentially the um, trial domains and the demographics domains. And while we see these far less frequently, because they affect all of the other data sets and the review of those data, when they occur, um, they are quite serious. So the first issue I wanted to bring forward here was related to animals removed from the study after the study started. This is not an uncommon activity. And the issue comes along uh, with how those data are reported in SEND versus how those data are reported in the study report. For example, if the data for the removed animal is also removed from the study report in the summarization, if those data are in the SEND data sets without being excluded uh, with the exclusion flag, then when the reviewer looks at the data, those removed animal results will be present. They'll be included in summarization. And there will be a mismatch between the summarization in Janus and the study report. So if you have removed animals, be mindful of how those are treated for summarization. And if you're going to put them in the SEND data sets, use the exclusion flag so that they may be automatically excluded from summarization by the reviewer. The next two issues are quite related. And they have to do with how animals are assigned to sets and how sets are assigned to groups. So Janus Nonclinical uses both sets and groups in its summarization. We've had studies where animals are assigned to the wrong sets. For example, a recovery animal was assigned to the terminal set, or vice versa, or a TK animal was assigned to a main set. And we've also had studies where the set is assigned to the wrong group, where a, a dosed set was assigned to a non-dosed group, for example. When these things occur, this trickles down to all of the data summaries. Janus Nonclinical does not include features for the reviewer to rearrange the animal assignments or the group assignments, nor should it. It's very important that these come in correctly so that all of the summarization, the animal, which animals go in which groups, all occurs automatically and aligns to the study report. The next item I'll cover is subject elements. So the subject elements at FDA is critical for identifying the epoch or study phase that the data is collected for. That variable is not included in SEND findings data sets. So Janus Nonclinical does a lookup from the data into SE to find the epoch or study phase for each piece of data. When SE has problems, we can't do that accurately. So some of the issues that we've encountered with SE are listed here. We've had SE not submitted at all, had overlapping dates and big gaps between dates for animals um, elements. And we've also had the study elements end well before the study ended and well before data collection ended. So in all these cases, we either can't assign a proper study phase or we potentially could be assigning a wrong study phase. 
and we can uh, continue to work through different algorithms to adjust for problems that people have with this. However, there is some limit to that. And so it's important to consider how SE aligns with the movement of animals from phase to phase and correctly assign those dates. We have a couple of views of um, how SE is used for this purpose. And this is our nicely areas where the SE was correct. So in this view, this is a clinical signs incidence by phase. We have three phases on the study, screening, treatment, and recovery. Now this is one ophthalmology clinical sign. Across the top, for males and females, we have the sets and the high dose group has two sets, terminal and recovery. So this is a great quick snapshot for the reviewer to be able to see what went on for clinical signs during the study. And we can see here that there was some high dose retinal atrophy and that, of course, it carried through on the recovery animals into the recovery phase. And this is another, another illustration, this time of salivation. And we can see that, the, that it started in treatment and then resolved in the recovery phase. So this is just one illustration of how this can be used uh, for comparison of data from one phase to the next by the reviewer, and thus the importance of supplying a correct and complete SE. Now I'm going to move to a few issues on the Study Data Reviewer's Guide. So the Study Data Reviewer's Guide is a, a very important document for all people at the FDA who are working with SEND data sets, particularly to understand the relationship between the data sets and the report. The level of detail that's included in the NSDRG varies significantly from study to study. Um, but we have seen in Kickstart some themes emerge. The most problematic area of the NSDRG has been the list of differences between SEND and the study reports. We frequently see ambiguous descriptions. We see differences mentioned that don't seem to apply to the data sets. And in some cases, the section's been omitted, or there just says, no differences. And I'm not entirely sure it's possible to have send data sets where there are no differences from the report. Since part of the Kickstart service is a full assessment and comparison of send with the study reports, we frequently find differences that are not documented in the NSDRGs. We also tend to see a lot of information in the NSDRG that's not relevant to the specific study that the NSDRG was submitted for. This includes uh, descriptions of data sets and variables that are not in the study, and descriptions how data would look in cases that don't apply to the study. And this can lead to quite a bit of confusion. As you acclimate yourself to the study, then you read the NSDRG, and it can seem quite contradictory. And so you're left to wonder if there's a problem with the study data or if there's a problem in the F with the NSDRG. We also see frequently that true validator warnings are written off as false positives. One fun fact for you is that the validator warning about duplicate data, we, anyone who's worked with SEND data sets are probably familiar with that one. 10 of the 79 studies that we reviewed in Kickstart actually had duplicate data. But the NSDRG said that the validator warning was false. And this, of course, when you have duplicate information, will affect the summary data. and. Um, so the message really is that um, be sure that you're not just assuming that these commonly false issues are actually false and take a review of the data set prior to submission. And the last thing to mention about the NSDRG is there frequently is 
uh, no mention of results or observations that are not in SEND. As Jesse mentioned, part of our Kickstart service, we provide this mapping between the study report and the SEND data sets. So to the left, you see a, a list of observations, tests, examinations performed on a study, and we try to align that with the study report, approximately the method section. Um, that's a good listing of, of the different observations done. Then across from each, we show the reviewer where that data is present in the SEND data sets. When the data is not submitted, then we can include a notation of this as well. We create that notation um, by reviewing the NSDRG, but we also do an independent assessment uh, to be sure that we are providing accurate information to the reviewer. So it's important to remember that all FDA reviewers are not experts in SEND. And so if something's out of scope for a particular SEND version, that might be obvious to someone who is well-schooled and embedded in the SEND community. Um, however, the reviewer may wonder why they're not seeing particular data that's coming through in their study report. Um, so this information would be very useful um, to include in the NSDRG very specifically what information is in your study report that is not in SEND. Okay. The last issue I'll cover very briefly is define XML. And while there are a lot of define XML issues in many submissions, and I'll note there's also some very good define XML files too, the one issue that continues to be a problem despite instructions being included in the technical conformance guide, is the reporting of the study name. That's all study, capital S, capital N, the study name element in Define XML. Reviewers know their application studies by the study ID that's in the application. Define XML, the study name element, is intended to include that application study ID. Janus uses that study ID when it creates its index of applications and studies. And so that's what the reviewer sees when they go to Janus to select a study to review. Very frequently, that study name is not aligned with the submission. We see sometimes the, the send ID, uh, the send study ID there. We see unknown or not available. And as you can imagine, if you have a whole bunch of studies in an application that just says the identifier is unknown, that could be fairly confusing. So again, this information of how to populate this is included in the Study Data Reviewer's Guide, and it is important that those instructions are followed. So I've talked a lot about problems. So let me end on a slightly more positive note. As Jesse mentioned, the Kickstart team tracks the issues that we see in the SEND data sets. And one thing we try to do is determine if there's some overall improvement in the quality of the studies we're seeing. So to do this, we use a metric that normalizes the number of issues found in the data sets to the number of findings data sets that are submitted for studies. Our objective there is to find a metric that will let us compare um, different complexities, different study types, um, different species of studies, um, kind of on an even ground. So this chart lists that metric going back from February of 2018 through May of 2019. You can see an ever so slight improvement in quality from the trend line, but you can also see a lot of variability there. So we thought also then, let's take a look at the last nine months, recognizing that it takes time for industry to digest and take action on uh, data fitness findings that come through to them. So when we look at just that last nine months, we get a much better improving trend line. And importantly, that last tall pole in the line was an interim submission. And so we'll be keeping an eye on interim submissions to see if there's 
different problems than we see in the finals or if this was an anomaly. But this is definitely a, a good trend, we believe. We're seeing improvements and we'll continue to monitor as that goes through. Okay. I'm going to turn this now back to Jesse for a few closing statements. Thanks, Jen. We realize we just threw a significant amount of information at you on this webinar, so to summarize, here are some key points we want you to take with you. The FDA saw a significant increase in the number of studies containing SIN data sets in the past year. The FDA farm talks reviewers are transitioning to utilizing SIN data sets alongside the study report. Because SIN data sets are new for many FDA Farm Talks reviewers, it is critical that sponsors submit complete and correct SIN data sets to allow reviewers to be confident that the data presented accurately represents the findings in the study report. We presented some common issues in SIN data sets that may complicate or even prevent FDA reviewers from using the submitted SIN data sets. To help increase the reviewer's confidence in the data, the FDA Kickstart team assists farm talks reviewers by identifying issues in SEND data to communicate with industry, identify any trends, and maximize the, maximize the use of their SEND data sets at the agency. Finally, FDA staff do our best to communicate SEND-related issues consistently across many different mediums. Specifically, we review SEND-related questions submitted to CEDAR eData and provide input when possible. We provide possible updates to the technical conformance guide and business rules that attempt to address issues we've seen in SEND submissions. We also send sponsor-specific study data fitness reports intended to help sponsors improve future data submissions. We prepare presentations, papers, and posters to present at FUSE events such as US Connect and the Computational Science Symposium. We also have a positive working relationship with CDISC through collaborations such as the face-to-face -face public forums and this webinar. Finally, collaborations such as the one FDA recently established with BioCellerate aims to identify gaps within existing presentations of SENS data sets and provide possible solutions to close those gaps. This concludes the presentation portion of this webinar. We are going to take a brief break to look at the questions you submitted, and we will be back in a All right, so we're back with a couple questions. The first one is, how do you count applications loaded on slides 5, 7, and 9? When an IND is open, it is followed by periodic updates. Are each of these updates counted as an application? So the answer is no. Uh, the periodic updates are not counted as a separate application. So when a revised uh, study is submitted, it is loaded as a new version of that study for that application and will not be counted as a new application loaded. Uh, the second question is send data required for both interim and final study reports. The answer is yes. So if the study start date is after December 17, 2017 and is a single dose, repeat dose talks, or a CARSI study, send data sets are required for both the interim and final study reports. And I'm going to answer a couple about the slides that I had. All right, so uh, this slide, or this question, I'm sorry, is related um, to the, I believe, the PC slide that showed the amount of time post dose, so the different uh, time points related to uh, the day one dose. The question is Would 48 hour and 72 hour PK time points be considered as day one as well? So the, the general philosophy is that uh, if, your, uh, if your sampling is timed based on a specific dose day, then all of the timing 
for the different sampling events relate back to that dose day. So if you had half hour, one, two, four, eight, on and on, after dose day one, those all have visit day one, as would a 48 and a 72 hour post dose day one. So you're really having, you know, visit DY is your dose day, then your time points are what was relative to that dose. And that all follows your scheduling. That's how your, your bleeds are going to be scheduled. The second question, these came in, um, there were several questions on this topic, so I'm going to paraphrase a bit. Um, it was about SE and the overlaps. And the question generally is, you know, is it okay for the end of one uh, phase to be the same as the start? And the answer is yes. That's expected by Sendai G3.0. In Sendai G3.1, I think there was some clarification on that, so there could be um, more continuous from one to the other, um, but that single day overlap is fine. The problems we encountered is when there was, in some cases, weeks of overlap, and we really had no idea what the intent of the sponsor was in that case. And uh, the third point that I will cover is related to the categorical data. And the question is, did I get this right? That LB stress N shall not be filled if the measurement was assessed semi-quantitatively. Generally, now I get to say that, um, the semi-quantitative results do not have means and standard deviation summary tables. They might have um, in the study report. You might have um, incidence tables. You know, what was the incidence of um, each result through the group um, at the different levels? In the case where there's incidences or there is no means and standard deviations, then don't fill stress in because those are not considered, quote, numeric data. Okay. And I believe that's all the time we have for questions, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ray uh, for some closing remarks. Thank you to all of our speakers for your very informative talk and also for responding to the questions that came in. A few closing reminders. This activity is eligible for continuing education by SOCRA, RAPS, SQA, and ACRP. Please refer to our website at fda.gov forward slash CDRSBIA for more details. You'll be able to obtain the attendance certificate only upon completion of the survey, which will remain open for two weeks. Let us know your comments and feedback via the survey. This will provide us with ideas for future improvements. For questions that were not answered, please resend to cedarsbia at fda.hhs.gov. On behalf of Cedar Small Business and Industry Assistance, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation and found it helpful. We look forward to your presence at future webinars, which will be advertised on our website at fda.gov forward slash CDRSBI webinars. Thank you.